Chair lays out a second reading, House Bill 1736, Court to read the bill. HB 1736, Viantia, relating to compensation of persons wrongfully imprisoned. Chair recognizes Mr. Anchia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. If I could get quiet in the hall, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> members, today we're going to be dealing with something very important. We frequently in this body make the trivial important, but we're not doing that today. We frequently in this body call balls and strikes on which industry is going to make more money, but we're not going to do that today. Uh, today when we said the Pledge of Allegiance, we talked about liberty and justice for all. So today, in House Bill 1736, is about trying to achieve some semblance of justice. I'd like for you to pay attention to the dais because we're not talking about abstract concepts today. We're talking about real men. And I'm going to tell you stories about innocent men who were sent to jail, whose families were ripped apart, who had children, who were separated from their fathers, and who are now trying to put their lives back together. With each story, I don't want you to think of these men as the other. I want you to think of them as us. Because frankly, what's happened to these men could happen to any of us. Happen to, happen to the representatives in this body. Happen to our children that we're very, very proud of and may be off at college. So I ask you for a few moments to think about walking in their shoes. The first person I want to talk to you about is James Waller. James Waller went to jail, an innocent man, in 1983. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. He served 11. After Waller was paroled, he was forced to register as a sex offender while he fought to clear his name. He met a woman who believed in him. He was honest with her. He told her his story, and she accepted him. They married, and he was going to be a father. While he and his wife struggled to prove his innocence, his wife and unborn baby were killed in a car accident. So standing alone, Mr. Waller finally proved his innocence via DNA evidence in 2007. I want to tell you about James Giles, James Curtis Giles, whose only sin was having a name similar to an offender named James Earl Giles, who actually committed the crime that James Curtis Giles was, was sentenced for. He went to jail in 1983, an innocent man, he was sentenced to 30 years. He sent, served 10 years in prison. Mr. Giles was married with a wife and a young son, and upon his parole, he went home with them. But because he was a registered sex offender, he couldn't stay. He was sent away. Couldn't live with his family. Ultimately, it cost him his marriage. And because of his status, he couldn't visit with his son, who was afflicted with sickle cell anemia, without being unsupervised. Stephen Phillips went to jail an innocent man in 1982. He was sentenced to 30 years. He spent 25 and a half years in prison. 
Mr. Phillips was a husband and a father and effectively lost his family. His children grew up thinking their father was a rapist. He also was unable to see his, his, his children for almost 30 years. Thomas McGowan went to jail an innocent man in 1985, sentenced to life in prison, and served 22 and a half years. During his, 20, his, his, over, his almost 23 years of incarceration, he lost his father, his grandparents, his sister. He missed watching his nieces and nephews grow up, and he lost any opportunity to have a family of his own. Charles Chapman was sent to jail, an innocent man, in 1981. He was sentenced to 99 years in prison. He served 26 and a half. These men are men of character, and, and the Chapman case underlies it all. On three different occasions, his parole came up. He said, Mr. Chapman, go to your parole hearing. He walked out of his cell, and at the parole hearing, he said, hey, just admit it. Just admit that you did it. If you admit your guilt, we'll give you parole. Each of the three times, he stood firm belie believing in the justice system and his innocence, and he walked back to his cell, an innocent man, to serve more of an unjust prison term. Billy Smith was sent to jail, an innocent man, in 1987, sentenced to life, served almost 20 years. The actual criminal went on to rape five more women in Dallas County before being caught. Since his release, he struggled to find a job, find a place to live, struggled to fit in, and until very recently was on the rolls as a sex offender, even though he was an exoneree. Ladies and gentlemen, there are dozens of other examples like the men I talked to you about today. But the one I'd like to share a little bit more about is Tim Cole because House Bill 1736 and its Senate Companion 2014 by Senator Duncan are called the Tim Cole Act. Tim Cole's picture is in front of us. And the reason Tim's case is, is so prescient is I'm 40 years old. Tim Cole died in jail when he was 39, an innocent man. He had served his country admirably and been discharged honorably from the Army and he went to Texas Tech University on the GI Bill. His sister was already a law student at Texas Tech University. In fact, his family was raised by his mother, who was an educator. Good family, good kids. And Tim Cole's only sin was being friendly to an undercover police officer outside a Pizza Hut, as most undergraduates would be. He was convicted and sent to jail an innocent man and labeled the Texas Tech rapist. The Texas Tech rapist actually went on to rape other women. The serial rapist continued to terrorize the campus even after Tim Cole was in jail. And year after year after year, the Cole family, his brother Corey Sessions, worked to clear his name. And finally, the true assailant, the true rapist, admitted his guilt after the statute of limitations. had passed. But sadly, Tim Cole died in 1999 of an asthmatic attack in jail. Let me tell you what this bill does. This bill increases the lump sum payout for exonerees. And I will tell you, this bill cannot make people whole. If we expect it to do that, we will be a miserable failure. There's truly no amount of money can make people whole. But I will submit to you, members, that we can do better than what we're doing now. And the lump sum payment only helps people get back on their feet. I mean, if you think about it, if you've been in jail for 20 and 25 years, you went in understanding a rotary phone, you're in an environment with laptops, iPods, you're in an environment with, with uh, new technology, you've had no skills, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have a 401k, you haven't been saving any money and you're thrust into this new world with, frankly, fewer services than par parolees get. Parolees are at least met with a $50 check and a parole officer and social services. These exonerees were pushed out the door, said, congratulations, we'll see you later. 
So the lump sum payment is important. We're going to increase the multiplier for the lump sum from 50000 to 80000 a year. The other thing this does is it creates an annuity on a go-forward basis so that when these men get out, they have an adjustment period to get their lives back together, to reunite with family, to try to get a job. And think about how hard it is to get a job or an apartment when you have to declare on your application, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Well, sure. Yes, I've been in jail for 25 years, but I'm innocent. Think about how hard it is to get a job with that record. And many of the men and the exonerees are dealing with that today. The other thing is many of, many of these innocent men were, were convicted of rape. And you're re you must be a registered sex offender. It's taken a long time for many of them to get off those state sex offender lists, but many of the private sex offender lists endure and will not change the information. So it is virtually impossible for, for these men to get a job. The other thing that this does is it gives these men health insurance. Some of these men have been denied Social Security and Medicare because they haven't paid into the system because they've been in jail for 25 years. So this, this gives them the same kind of insurance that you and I might have as members of this state house through our state program. And the final thing that this does is it gives them education. They can go to school for free for up to 120 hours at a, at a career center, at a community college, or at a university. Because as we all know, it is much better to teach a man the fish than to give them fish. And this helps them get their lives on track. Many of these men sat in jail longer than they were outside free men. Two other important things that I think this bill does that you should know about. The first thing is that if any of these men is convicted of a subsequent felony, they lose the money. So this incents them to, to play by the book, to play by the rules, and to stay out of trouble. The other thing it does is if they take this money from the state, they can't sue. Okay? And that's been important because in Austin alone, we've had recoveries of $9 million and $5 million by exonerees. So if they take this package, they forego their 42 U.S.C. 1983 lawsuit, okay? And we know where there are many pending in the courts today, so this does help cities avoid costly and lengthy lawsuits for civil rights violations. And ladies and gentlemen, Tim Cole wrote a letter to his sister when he was sitting in jail. His sister was uh, in law school at Texas Tech, and he urged her not to leave Texas Tech. She was distraught by the situation and he said to her, quote, I still believe in the justice system, even though the justice system does not believe in me. So, Mr. Speaker and members, I ask you to support the Tim Cole Act so that we, we can restore the faith of these men in our justice system and we can do right by them and this state. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I move adoption. Is there anyone wishing to speak for or against House Bill 1736? Question occurs on passage to engrossment of House Bill 1736. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. House Bill 1736 is passed to engrossment. Thank you. So, let, me ask you oh, let, me, let me recognize these men. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I think some special recognitions are, are, are in order. In the gallery, and I, I may not have everyone's name, but our friends, family, and many of the exonerees themselves, in the gallery we have James Waller, James. We have Charles Chapman, Charles. We, we've got Patrick Waller, there's Patrick. We've got Stephen Phillips, Stephen. We've got Wiley Fountain. Is Wiley Fountain here? We've got Billy McGowan. Billy McGowan, please stand up. And we've got John Lindsay. John, please rise. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for being here. God bless you.
Mr. Speaker and members, there are also other people I want to thank uh, on this on this legislation. Senator Duncan, who is carrying the counterpart in the Senate. Uh, Chairman Gallego, who is very, very helpful and collaborative during this process and allowed me to, to carry this bill. And our joint authors, Yvonne Davis, Dan Branch, Terry Hodge, and Carl Isett. And thank you to you members for helping do some, uh, some level of justice for these men whose lives have been impacted by the system that failed them. Thank you.